So, I got Michio Kaku to reply to two of my questions last night on his iTunes Q&A session. I posted seven questions in all, and of course, he picked the two softballs. I specifically threw a few softballs in there to make sure he was actually seeing my questions and reading them. The first question was about Type 1 transportation systems, like ET3, Hyperloop, and J-Pods. And he basically said what all the other scientists have been saying all along, that the most difficult component needed to build these systems will be the superconductors and supermagnets, which are super expensive right now to make, and how in the future we will need to discover a complete theory of superconductivity in order to build room temperature superconductors, which will help us build the maglev components of the future physical internet. I thought that this was interesting because many of the new insights into quantum physics that I've learned about over the past few years from studying cold fusion could have potential applications toward a more complete understanding of superconductivity. Specifically, what Nathan Cohen said two weeks ago at the Cold Fusion LANR Colloquium Conference at MIT, where he discussed metamaterials and his fractal antenna systems, and how the geometry, possibly fractal arrangements of Cooper pairs inside a superconductor, could be the key to understanding the nature of superconductivity. Unfortunately, mainstream physics is completely unaware of all these new insights because they still think cold fusion isn't real and aren't paying any serious attention to the breakthroughs that have happened in this field of physics over the past 25 years. Which brings me to the other question of mine that Dr. Kaku answered about cold fusion. I asked several questions about cold fusion, and of course he picked the most softball one, and even then didn't really address what my real question was nor did he address the follow-up statements that I made correcting some of the points that he made in, in reaction to me. Well, I'll go through it. If cold fusion turned out to be real, do you think the modern scientific establishment would embrace it or just continue to ridicule it like so many other new ideas in science have been ridiculed because they challenged established dogma? Okay, so here was his first answer. Science is based on testable, reproducible, and falsifiable results, no matter how revolutionary they may be. So if cold fusion were shown to satisfy these criteria, then scientists would have to accept it. However, even its promoters admit that results in one lab are not necessarily duplicatable in another lab. Hence, the verdict on cold fusion is still out. Cold fusion has to work every time, not just sometimes. Until this criterion can be met, there will always be skeptics. Well, simply saying that scientists would have to accept it says nothing about social stigmas within the scientific community regarding cold fusion and whether or not scientists would actually accept it, which was clearly part of my question, or the main point of my question. Certainly in the past, promoters of cold fusion have claimed that the results were not always able to be replicated, but a lot has changed in this field over the years since that time. And the most recent work being done in cold fusion appears to indicate that we are on the verge of a major paradigm shift in terms of the experimental replication of the effect. I encourage Dr. Kaku and the rest of the physics community to check out Mike McCubre's work on PDD loading ratio as a predictor of success in cold fusion experiments. Check out Mitchell Schwartz's quasi one-dimensional loading model and some of the papers on co-deposition methods to make sure that you are loading your cathodes fully and properly. And then check out some of the current replication initiatives, such as the one on quantumheat.org using the Chelani cell, which seems to be the most understandable and replicable LENR demonstration to date. There are others in this field also making serious progress toward a model for 100% guaranteed replication, such as Larry Forsley and Pam Boss of Spaywar, or Eric L. Bohir of the University of Missouri. So please check out their work as well. You'll be very surprised at the progress that's being made. But regardless of whether or not the effect is 100% replicable all the time, remains the fact that the effect is actually replicable. We just don't fully understand what's causing it or how it works yet. But the fact remains that it does work. There is something there. This is not uncommon in groundbreaking scientific discoveries or technological developments throughout history. Do you think that all of Thomas Edison's first light bulbs worked on the first try? What do you think would have happened if inventors like him simply gave up after the first several failed attempts? Basing your predictions of future success based on past failures is clearly not the best approach to take in science. Dr. Kaku also made a second and third reply to the same question, perhaps to further elaborate his point. He says, for example, a car company will not use a cold fusion engine that works some of the time, but not other times. It has to work every time without fail. And so far, it's not been able to do this. And then his third reply was, Japanese car companies years ago spent millions trying to get cold fusion to work, but they finally gave up. 
This is not entirely true. They didn't give up. They ran out of funding. There's a huge difference. After all, we were comparing a few petty million that has been invested into cold fusion research to the billions spent on other areas of physics like tokamak reactors and particle accelerators. Claiming that they gave up implies a failure of legitimate science and not a failure of funding, which was actually the case here. Also, some of those Japanese car companies are still working on cold fusion research. Yasuhiro Iwamura of Mitsubishi Heavy Industries was at the MIT colloquium two weeks ago, and he is making serious progress on methods for breaking down radioactive waste through elemental transmutation based on cold fusion physics principles. He thinks we might be able to use this new technology to eliminate radioactive waste, and he is researching just that in his laboratory in Japan at Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. So please, a lot has changed in 25 years since the days of Pons and Fleischmann, and a lot is going to change in the next 25 years. And if Dr. Michio Kaku is still around then, he is going to regret not taking this topic a bit more seriously. I am predicting that a major paradigm shift will happen in this field within the next five to 10 years. Just wait and see. So anyways, I'll be rephrasing a bunch of my questions for the next AMA that he hosts so I can hammer him with much more difficult questions for him to answer. Thanks for watching. I'm the Alien Scientist. Please subscribe if you want to see more rocking videos on new science and technology in the future. Also check out coldfusionnow.org where you can find all the presentations from the MIT Cold Fusion Colloquium and get the realest, most up-to-date science on cold fusion.